day. So again, congratulate all the veterans and thank you for your service. Uh, actually, Danny explained to me that he used to work at an Air Force base in California. So and a lot of us had different jobs and things that we did that help servicemen. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Revelation chapter 13. If you have your Bibles or on your phones, turn to Revelation chapter 13. But also turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to start off because we're going to go there first, then Revelation 13. So stick one finger in one place, one finger in the other, right? you got plenty of fingers, right? Okay, so we're going to talk about the rise of the Antichrist. We're in the middle of the book of Revelation. Now what's interesting, this is probably the most popular chapter among prophecy teachers, prophecy, prophecy guys, right? You always hear about this chapter. Okay, it's about the Antichrist. It's about the false prophet, and it's about that number 666. That's all covered in this chapter. People talk about this chapter all the time. Uh, so the Antichrist, we're going to talk about him today. Then next week or the week after, we'll talk about the false prophet. Then we'll get into 666. I'm going to cover this cha chapter in reasonable detail, okay? But I don't want to be too academic or too boring, so we're not going to spend forever in it. But I just want to get you to understand it, because this is an important chapter to understand, okay? Um, but understanding this chapter requires some understanding of some other chapters. So we're going, to, we're going to go over to chapter 17 a little bit, and we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 a little bit, just to get a good understanding. Because once you understand this chapter, you're going to have a good understanding of what's talked about as far as prophecy. Now, as we go through the book of Revelation, each week you'll gain a little bit more of knowledgeable understanding of this uh, chapter. So today when we talk about the Antichrist, um, he, we met him already. Remember back in chapter 6, verse 2, on the white horse, that was the Antichrist with the bow and the crown. He brought in false peace, and it didn't last very long because the very next horse was the red horse, which was war and anarchy. So... He is the guy that was on that white horse that we talked about in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. We saw him again in Revelation chapter 11. Remember them two uh, witnesses that were on the earth and they were going out and preaching the gospel there in Jerusalem for God? And then the Antichrist came and killed them both. We kind of debated and talked about, is this Elijah, Enoch, Moses, or two other guys? You know, it doesn't say specifically who they are, but they were killed. And then they rose, after three and a half days, they rose up to heaven. Okay, they got raptured. So we talked about them, but we met the Antichrist there, but not in detail. So we're going to get a little more detail in him in the next few weeks. Um, but recent world events, I want to encourage you. And I'm not going to be, sound like I'm some kind of doomsday or that the world's coming to an end. But I'll tell you what, you need to pay attention to what's going on. Be concerned, because time is short. Uh, make sure you're passing out tracts. We have, we have hundreds of tracts you can give out. And Tony, can I tell you a story? Okay, Chris told me Tony gave to a track to a, a man the other day, and this man kind of looked at her kind of like he was a little bit not real friendly looking, and so, but Tony still gave him a, crack and to, a track and told him, God loves you. And as she turned around, some lady said, that just warmed my heart. So there's people watching. So giving tracks out, God's going to bless you. And could that have been an angel on the wear? You don't know. But I think that was kind of cool. That's a neat story. So good Good job, Tony, for doing that. And maybe we'll see people in heaven because you give it, gave them a track. You may never see them in church, but hey, keep doing it. Invite people. Pray for them. Invite them to our Christmas, uh, I guess you will call this luncheon at 1 o'clock now. The ladies changed the time from, from the 5 to 1 o'clock because we thought it would be better to have it during the day so that people don't have to come out at night. But taco bar sounds like a lot of fun. But even if you don't bring anything, Chris will have a list, so please go ahead and bring friends because there are plenty, plenty of food for everybody. Okay, so these current worldly events are kind of precursors to the fulfillment that the Bible, talk, Bible talks about. There's so many things going on in this world today, it's just accelerating. And you just need to be prepared for this and understand this. Let me give you a verse, okay, and Ken Hall gives, talks about this verse quite often, and that's Ezekiel 3.18. If you, and I'm going to paraphrase it, okay? If you do not tell the unsaved about salvation, they will die in their sins, and God will require their blood on your hands. So please understand, God wants us to share the gospel with people. The easiest thing you can do is take one of them tracts and just hand it to them and say, hey, please, if you get a chance, read this. You need to know what it says here about going to heaven. 
and then you can invite them to church if you want to. But people need to understand this because the gospel has been so muddied and so watered down in the world today that people don't really know for sure if they're going to heaven or not. And don't you think that's a pretty important thing to know and understand? It really is. It's very important. So please, please, please don't live your life in fear. We, don't you get tired of being, living your life in fear sometimes? We got to. We got to get over that, living our lives in fear. What do we have to fear, okay? Please, let's be courageous. Let's be bold. Let's stand up for Christ and be a witness for him. Okay, so I will explain today but I, about this beast and somewhat about the Antichrist and about this 666. And I'm going to say that the Antichrist represents an emperor, but he also represents an empire. He is a man, and he's an evil world system. So we're going to talk about today as we get in here. So we're going to look at Revelation 13, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, a couple of verses there. And we'll talk about the man of sin. That's his name given in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, you know what TMI means, right? Too much information. So I hope I'm not giving you too much information today. I mean, I think uh, you may get a little bit of a headache. Okay, but you go home and you can take some ibuprofen, right? and rest a little bit because there's a lot to cover here and so we're going to go through this chapter and by the time we're done I hope you really have a good grasp and understanding of it so let's go ahead first of all I want to do an overview because once you do an overview of this chapter and get a little grasp and understanding of it when we go back over it through verse by verse you'll li really really grasp it so let me give you a simple outline of this chapter okay it's divided into three parts antichrist false prophet mark of the beast okay antichrist is verses 1 through 10 of chapter 13. The first 10 verses are the Antichrist. The next five verses, uh, 11 through 15, is talks about the false prophet, okay? Then the last three verses, 16, 17, and 18, talk about the mark of the beast, okay? So that's a simple outline of this chapter. Very easy, right? Easy to remember, easy to understand. Okay, so, Revelation 13 summary. The main characters of this chapter... I have already mentioned, are the Antichrist and the false prophet. And I call them Beast 1.0 and Beast 2.0, okay? Beast 1.0 is the Antichrist. He comes from the sea, and I'm going to explain that. I believe he's a Gentile, okay? So we'll go through and we'll understand this as we go through this. And then the uh, Beast 2.0, which is a false prophet, he comes from the earth. I personally believe he's Jewish. But, you know, it doesn't say specifically or exactly. I just look at the Bible and try to understand, interpret it from what I see by compared verses with verses. So I believe the Antichrist is Gentile. I believe the false prophet is probably Jewish, okay? Um, but don't hold me to that. Don't tell me in heaven a bell you're wrong. But we'll see. <laughs> okay. Beast 1.0. Let's talk about him first. That was verses 1 through 10 of chapter 13. It says there, and this is just an overview, as I mentioned, an overview or a summary, the Antichrist has seven heads, ten hordes, and seven crowns. Sounds kind of gruesome, doesn't it? What kind of person is this? And then, he has names of blasphemy on his head. Now, what does it mean by names of blasphemy? Well, this guy claims himself as God. That's pretty blasphemous, isn't it? He, he claims he's God. Every time there's some kind of false prophet, they always try to take deity upon themselves and claim that they're actually God. So, it says he's like a leopard, bear, and lion. And we're going to talk about this soon. The leopard represents the nation of Greece back in history. The bear represents Media Persia, and the lion represents Babylon. We're going to look at that here in just a second. But this Antichrist empire has the characteristics of these empires all rolled into one. These three empires all rolled into one. So here's the thing. If I repeat things more than once, we really start to grasp it. So that's why I'm going to repeat myself and try to make sure to really, really reiterate some of this stuff so we get a good grasp of it. Okay, so now the fourth bullet point here, or minor bullet point, he receives his power from the dragon. We've learned that the dragon is Satan, right? So God allows Satan to do what he does to fulfill God's purpose, okay? God allows it. Who's really in charge, though, right? God the Father is, right? He's in charge. He allows Satan to do this. And we talk, we'll talk about here that this Antichrist is healed from a fatal head wound. I personally believe that he dies and gets brought back to life. But we'll dig into that a little bit as we get into this in the next couple of weeks. Okay, I like what Dave Hunt said. Now, Dave Hunt was a Bible scholar. He's passed away now. But he said this, prophecy, teaches present, prophecy teachers present the Antichrist as an evil monstrosity that opposes Christ. 
but he in actuality will appear to be the Christ. That's something you've got to understand. Okay? We look at this Antichrist, oh, he, the second we see him, he's going to have horns and he's going to do, have a pitchfork and blah, 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 and he's going to look evil. No, he comes and looks like he's the person that you think should be the leader of the world. Now, I believe we, as Christians, if you trust in Christ, we will be gone. We won't get to meet this guy, I'm sorry. But he is going to be appealing to people because they're saying, this is the guy we've always needed as a leader. And I like what Dave Hunt said there. But this guy is going to be malevolent. He's going to be evil. He's going to be harmful. He's going to be malicious. But uh, outward appearance and what he says to start off with is going to sound like this is the man, right? Okay, Jesus referred to in, in Matthew 24, 24 as a pseudo-Christ. He was referred to in Mark 13, 32 as a false Christ. That's a fake replica of the real thing. And that is who the Antichrist is going to come as. He's going to fool people. You must know your Bible. Be careful about pride. There's plenty of people, and I've heard them say to me, well, I know the Bible and I'm a genius and I know everything, and if you have any questions, see me. Plenty of people say that. Okay, what nerve do they have? And we've got some people here that know their Bibles very well. A lot of you guys do very well. But none of you guys are going to stand up and say, I'm a scholar in the Bible and I know everything. We don't, do we? We have so much to learn. So be careful about being prideful and think we know everything about the Bible. Continually search the Scriptures to see if these things are true. Be humble. Let the Holy Spirit work in your life and reveal things to you in the Bible because none of us know everything. There's so much to learn in this Bible. So remember, never get to the point where you start thinking you have and you're the all in all. Because when you get to that point, pride, pride brings destruction, doesn't it? You know, God, God will humble you. So it's better for you to be the best you can as you're humble. None of us are really humble, are we? No, not really. And we always have to realize and understand that, that we tend to get prideful at times. So let's go ahead and look at this beast 1.0. The dragon and beast, 1.0, are worshipped by the earth dwellers. So the dragon is Satan, the beast is the Antichrist, the earth dwellers, we see that's mentioned nine times in the book of Revelation, okay? Referred to as earth dwellers. Who are earth dwellers? The people that are, remain after the rapture of the true church. They're left on this world, and they love this world. And they're probably, we talked about Thursday night, that a lot of people, are there, they're happy that when the church gets taken out of here, because now they can set up their one world government. Okay, they love this world. They are in all honesty anti-true God. Now, I'm not saying they're not religious. There's plenty of people that will be religious in some somewhat different ways, okay? You know now they're making an electronic version of the Ouija board? I mean, horrific. I mean, can you imagine that? It's like Satan come into my world, and, and people are fooled by it. I remember when I, as a kid, used the Ouija board, and I did it with my sister, and I thought, she must be moving this board because it's saying some weird stuff. But after that, I said, no, no more. I'm not getting into this. Don't play with that stuff. Don't play with stuff because you're inviting and opening the door to things that can happen that you don't want to happen. But here, this guy blasphemies God and goes to war against the saint. Blasphemy, he has a hatred for the true God. War means he battles. In other words, he fights against Christians. Who are the saints? Anyone that comes to Christ after the rapture during this seven-year tribulation. Okay, Jewish or Gentile. Um, anybody that comes to Christ. So understand that. And so that's Beast 1.0. Now, Beast 2.0, we see here, that's verses 11 through 15, the five verses, the false prophet. And he is, the false prophet is a religious leader, um, possibly Jewish, as I mentioned. Um, by the way, he's the right-hand man to the Antichrist, okay? And he's, he's the right man, serves him. But you know what? He, the Antichrist gets rid of him later on. Do you know that? I mean, what a loyalty, right? So, but he forces... Worship to the Antichrist. He has two horns, like a lamb, speaks like a dragon. He appears quite docile until he speaks. That's what the Bible says, and we're going to learn about this. This false prophet looks like he's such a kind, peaceful person, but when he speaks, it sounds bad. Did you know they say that when Adolf Hitler used to get up and speak, that it was a different voice, and it was almost like eerie? It's what, what voice is coming out of Adolf Hitler? Well, I think this guy here is going to be a similar type manner, okay? But it says he performs, uh, he forces worship of the Antichrist, um, the man of the world. They look at him as a savior, and he, the false prophet, forces worship. It says he performs wonders, like fire comes down from heaven. Don't be fooled by this uh, wonders and miracle movement that goes on today. We don't need that. 
read God's word. Understand God's word. Walk by faith for what God's word says. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said this, this person will deceive the world, so be careful. And he does deceive the earth dwellers. They're like puppets in his hands. They're like pawns. He says, uh, wear a mask, take a shot, do this, only travel this far, all these things, and people are getting conditioned for this to obey it, and it's going to get worse and worse. So we're getting prepared, right? Little by little, the world is getting prepared for this man of sin that's going to come upon this world. And the false prophet here creates an image. That word is actually where we get the word icon from, and it's a likeness. It means a likeness, that he creates an image of the Antichrist that comes to life. And we say, wow, what's that going to be like? Ten years ago, we talked about this. Twenty years ago, 30, 40 years. Today, I think we can pretty simply see that what they're doing with AI, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, how they're intermeshing and mingling uh, machine and humans and so on. There's so many things going on that they're doing behind it. I think we only hear some of it that's going on. I think some of this stuff is done in secret. But hey, science, technology, to the point where there'll be robotic humans, humanized robots, and I think this is coming and they're going to look so real. Go on uh, Google and search, now I don't want to promote Google, but go on Google and search um, artificial intelligence and see what it pulls up. You'll, you'll be amazed, some of the stuff that you see in there. Or in YouTube, go on YouTube and, and listen to some of the stuff that's talked about. It's, it's amazing, and I believe that this image of the Antichrist is going to be something that's going to be fabricated, okay? I remember back as a kid, in 1973, there was this TV show called The Six Million Dollar Man. How many of you heard of that, Six Million Dollar Man? Probably all of you, right? Anybody over 40 years old, all you young people don't know what The Six Million Dollar Man is. But this Antichrist is going to be like The Six Million Dollar Man on steroids. I mean, it, I remember there was a song in 1974 by a rock group. This is before I saved. And BTO, Bachman Turner Overdrive. And they said, you know, the song was, You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet. Okay, and we haven't. We ain't seen nothing yet, I'll tell you. What's going to be developed and created here is going to be absolutely amazing, and it's going to fool the world. So that's what we're going to talk about as we go through the, the book of Revelation here, and especially here as we get into Revelation chapter 13. So let's look a little bit at the mark of the beast. And as I said, the mark of the beast is going to be talked about in verses 16, 17, and 18. And everyone must receive it on the right hand or forehead. Right hand, forehead. Okay? And it's epi. The word is, Greek word is epi. It means in, on, or upon. Now, is this going to be a chip? Is this going to be a tattoo or a stamp or what it's going to be? I don't know exactly. But it's, I believe it could be on and in. Okay? I believe it could be a chip and a mark on your forehead. Basically, you're not going to be able to buy or sell without this. Okay? So, basically, you go in a store, B picks you up. If you don't have it, you don't buy. You don't sell. No more garage sales, people, okay? No more going to a farmer's market and buying stuff anymore. You've got to have this mark on you, and that's what it says here. It's going to be on you, and they're working on this right now, aren't they? You might be pretty naive to realize this is not being created right now. Banks are getting ready to go over to digital currency, aren't they? Digital currency means there's no such thing as paper money anymore. Digital currency means everything's controlled. Digital currency means that you don't follow my rules. We shut you off. Digital currencies, we can keep track of you. And if you're giving money to church, oh, you're going to get a low score, uh, score from us, okay? And it's going to get bad. So be prepared and understand this. We're going to be to the point, if we don't get raptured, before this time happens, there may be some pressure put on us to say, are you going to stand for Christ or not? Realize that, Christians, and, and understand that. Okay, so we'll talk about the specifics of this and the possibilities of this later on. But you cannot buy or sell with this mark. It's the word harigma, and it means a stamp or like a cow. You know, you brand a cow. That's what it's kind of going to mean. So as I said, you're going to be tracked on everything you do, everywhere you go, and so on. It's going to be an oppressive system that they're going to have you under their thumb. They call that a dystopian society, don't they? Dystopian society. Um, it's going to be as bad as it can get. It really is. You, you ain't going to be able to do whatever you want to do because they're going to have the control of you. Now, you guys, if you know Christ the Savior, we're going to be zooped up here. We won't have to worry about that. If you don't know Christ the Savior and you're watching this on YouTube or you're sitting here this morning, you better consider about trusting Christ the Savior because you're not going to go through a picnic if the church is gone and they go into the tribulation time period. Okay, so we'll see what this number means. 
Uh, basically, 666, you know God, number seven, complete, uh, perfect number. So that's the highest Satan can go. 666 is his trinity, okay? That's all he can do. And you know who, what the trinity is, right? It's the dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet. Satan, the false prophet, the antichrist. Okay, that's, that's Satan's simulated trinity that he's going to have here today. So before we get into this, let's do uh, the mark of the beast. Okay, I mentioned that. Let's do first things first. Church members won't get to meet this guy. You know down through history, if you studied the Bible or prophecy, there's always pointing out somebody that, hey, this guy's going to be the Antichrist. This guy could be the Antichrist. Well, yeah, possibly. But let's go ahead, and if you're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm going to have to flip there. Give me just a second. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. We'll read this. Now, Paul wrote this chapter, 2 Thessalonians, shortly after 1 Thessalonians. And the reason he wrote 2 Thessalonians is because the people in Thessalonica thought, we're in the tribulation. Things are bad. So Paul writes 2 Thessalonians to explain to them, no, you're not. Okay, so let me read verses 1 through 3 of 1 Thessalonians, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. I think that's referring to the rapture. So Paul's saying, hey, if you guys are still here, you're not in the tribulation because you're not going to be here. So he says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you soon, ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ or the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a fallen away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now we touched on this a little bit Thursday night when we talked about eternity uh, this last Thursday. But let's get into this a little bit here. Notice it says our gathering together unto him, as we read there. That's talking about our gathering together unto him when he brings us up in the rapture of the church. And so, then we see that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, the tribulation, it hasn't started yet, okay? And Paul's trying to tell them that. He says, first of all, there has to be a fallen away first, okay? And here's what we're going to talk about. That word that for fallen away is the word apostasia. Whenever you see a word apostasia, you always think of uh, fallen away, drifting away from the Bible or scriptures, right? Just like the word repentance. When people hear the word repentance, oh, I'm sorry for my sins, turn from my sins. Repentance literally means change your mind. And look at the context. What do you have to change your mind about? That's what the word repentance means. But apostasia literally means departure or forsaking, okay? And so, I've studied this, and back many, many, many years ago, a, a, a biblical scholar named Dwight Pentecost, most of you heard of this, he believes in this. And I think that's the first time I saw it many, many years ago. Dwight Pentecost. Uh, Tim LaHaye believes it means departure, referring to the rapture. And so does Thomas Ice, believes that when it says fallen away, apostasy, it's not talking about apostasy from Bible doctrine. It's talking about fallen away, being departure, departure of this world, being raptured. <coughs> Thomas Ice believes that. Andy Wood believes it. Andy Wood wrote an excellent book. If you ever want to see this, I can lend it to you. It's 44 pages, or you can purchase it online. But he explains and he goes through it in depth. So I really got a lot out of this book. But I already understood this and believed that was true that it was talking about the rapture. But after reading this book, it kind of put a nail in it, okay? I nailed it. This is an excellent book. Anybody wants to read this, come and see me. Or you can purchase it. It's only 44 pages, but it's pretty in depth. So here's the thing. Back before 400 A.D., Latin Vulgate. That's where the Catholics got their Bible, from the Latin Vulgate. Did you know the Latin Vulgate, before 400 A.D., it had the word departure in there, and not apostasy, not apostasy or not fallen away. It really did. And then the Wycliffe Bible of 1384, departure. The Tyndale Bible of 1526, departure. The Geneva Bible of 1608, departure. So all these Bibles had the word departure in there, referring that it referred to the rapture. When the King James came along and some other versions, then they all of a sudden put, apost put it in there, and they believe it's drifting from doctrine or false teaching, okay? So... I'm going to give you my five reasons why I believe this talks about the rapture, okay? I don't have this on the screen. But my five reasons is, first of all, in the context, when you look there at verse 1, it says, gathering together unto him. What do you think that's talking about? Paul is warning them that, hey, you're not going to go through the tribulation. If you're still here, the tribulation have to, hasn't started yet. So my first reason is, 
The context in verse 1 talks about gathering together unto him. And then the second one says that day approaching, that day there in verse 3 is it, no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come. Listen, if it was apostasy, we know apostasy through the ages has been up and down, up and down, up and down, right? In fact, the Philadelphian church was probably less, less apostasy than there is today or before it, okay? So apostasy has come and gone. It even started out way back in uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 3 in 66 AD when Jude wrote about it that he says, hey, I need to write about the faith because it's getting worse and worse. But it's always been apostasy. So I don't think we can say truly this is a line of demarcation when apostasy started, can we? I mean, it's always been, it's, it's, it's up and down, it's all over. Now, I think as we get later and later into the end times, we're going to say apostasy is, you know, the faith, belief in the faith is down, eh, not good. But anyway, so I believe that day, you can't define that day specifically if you're going to be talking about apostasy. But if you're talking about the rapture, the church being gone, you can understand that day pretty clearly, like right? we're gone. Then the Antichrist can be revealed. So my third point is look in verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, verse 7, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let will let until he be taken out of the way. So who's that talking about? It's talking about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, when he leaves, he, the, the, Satan is allowed to do what he does. The Antichrist is allowed to do what he does. So that's talking about the Holy Spirit, okay? In verse 7. And where is the Holy Spirit right now? Seals us, right? Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 4.30, he's within us. So when we get taken out of the way, then, verse 7, you can see it already works, but only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. When the Holy Spirit leaves, we go with him, right? Because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. The word sealed means sealed. So that's the truth. So that's my third point. My fourth point is, look at verse 17 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Do you remember... In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, talking about the rapture, verse 18 says, comfort each other, because the rapture is comforting. How would you be comforted if you were going to go through the tribulation? I don't think so, right? But if you know you're not going to be here, you'll be comforted. Isn't it funny that Paul says, comfort your hearts in verse 17, as he did also in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18? So that was my fourth reason. My fifth reason is... The only other place in the New Testament where this word is used is in Acts chapter 21, verse 21. In Acts chapter 21, verse 21, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were coming down on the Apostle Paul saying, you're teaching that we should forsake Moses. In fact, it uses that word forsake. You should say, saying we should depart from Moses. We should leave Moses. Paul wasn't saying that at all, but he was just saying, you know, you can't be saved by the law. You only be saved by faith. But they accused him of that, that he was forsaking Moses. So that word was translated as forsake. You're moving away. You're departing from Moses. So that's my five reasons why I believe that 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, is talking about the rapture of the church being taken up. Hey, but please understand this. I'm not saying there's not going to be apostasy. They go hand in hand to some extent, right? It says... In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, the last days, the faith is going to get worse and worse. We're going to be apostasies. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in fact, read the whole chapter of 2 Timothy chapter 3. It tells you the, what the world's going to be like in the last days. I think we're there, people. Read 2 Timothy chapter 3. Understand that. Say, okay, is this what's happening today? And Jesus said in Luke 18, 8, Luke 18, 8, he says, when I come back, will there be any faith on the earth? There's something interesting to study, and we'll do this sometime. The Bible talks about the faith. The faith is the body of beliefs that we have. That faith is going downhill. Now people want entertainment, they want music, they want fun, happiness, and, and messages that make everybody feel good and happy. They go out the door, they're smiling, laughing, and then they sit at home and say, what did we talk about church today? Well, I don't know. I, we felt good, we laughed, we have, we're happy, we're friendly, and so on and so on. But you know what? You need to learn the Bible. You really need to learn the Bible. So... I like what John Hagee says. This is what John Hagee says. To know who the Antichrist is, is of no practical purpose or value to the church, since we will be in heaven. We don't need to know. Why would we want to know? Uh, would you? We're not going to know. We'll be in heaven, okay? So that's what John Hagee says. I thought that was pretty good. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into uh, verse 1 of Revelation chapter 13.
Okay, we're going to read verse 1 of chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. It says here, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now I'm going to explain something with this verse that kind of put things together for me to help understand it, but first of all, John, the apostle John, remember he went to heaven, he's receiving a vision that he is standing on the sand of the sea, okay? And the sand of the sea, that word sea is a symbol or metaphorically for Gentile humanity, okay? The world of humanity out there. That's what sea means. And we'll see this as we study this more. But look at the next here. I put, he saw a beast. Why is he called a beast? Well, it's like an animal, right? Like a wild beast, really. No feelings. Rise up out of the sea. And when I say sea, I think that symbolically refers to the Gentiles nations. That's why I believe he's a Gentile. Anti-Semitic is all get out. Uh, we see that in Revelation 17, 15. We'll see that later on. But it's a symbol for the great masses of humanity. Back in Daniel chapter 7, verse 3, we'll see that the beast, the four beasts back there came out of the sea also. So we can put this together. And I think the sea, when it talks about the sea, it's referring to humanity, Gentile humanity, okay? Okay. But then it says, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, I like what Dr. Andy Wood said here, and I, it kind of makes things sense to me, and it clicks, that only one head can be at a time, okay? So when you look at these seven heads, as I mentioned before, there's been seven empires down through the ages. Actually, the seventh one isn't here yet. There's been uh, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, or Medo persia Then there was Greece. Then there's Rome 1.0. Remember Rome? back and started in the B.C. first century there and continued on and eventually it dissipated, it divided into two, two sections. And then Rome 2.0, that's going to be what's going to come today when this gets revived, this Roman Empire. Okay, so it says here, having seven heads and ten horns. Uh, so I think the seven heads refers to these successive empires. Uh, as we know, when it talks about this Antichrist coming out of the sea, um, Revelation 11, 7, and 17, 8 actually says this is the pit, right? This is that evil pit of hell, of we don't, I, I don't know even how to describe it, but he comes out of that abyss, the pit, and that's 11, 7, and also Revelation 17, verse 8. But continuing on about his horns and ten crowns, horns in the Bible always, always refers to power. I've got power. You have power. So then ten crowns are what's called diadems. That means it's... A, he was put in position as a leader or a king or an authority of power. So the ten crowns are power. They were given this diadem of kings over these ten sections or areas of the world. And it says on here, upon his heads the names of blasphemy. Upon his horns ten crowns, but upon his heads the names of blasphemy. The beast claims to be God. We know that, okay? So I'm going to give you a picture of depicting of what it says here in Revelation 13 verse 1. Now, that's just somebody's drawing, but it's pretty gruesome, right? You look at that and you say, oh, that give me nightmares. Okay, so another picture of it, describing it. Okay, when you look at it, you try to do an artistic drawing of it, and that's what people think when they see it, but you see what I'm saying there. But this beast here represents the final end-time emperor and empire, okay? Just as we know in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar was the king over Babylon, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and Babylon, the emperor and the empire were kind of feel, see, seen as one and the same, okay? And that's the way it is with the, the beast and his empire that he sets up in this world. He is the Antichrist. Now, do you know where that word Antichrist is written at in the Bible? Which books? Only in 1 John and 2 John, okay? Five times where it reverses that word. It's not a past man. It's not somebody in the past. Now, people will look at back in the uh, late... 30s, early 40s, there was a guy named Caligula, Caligula, you know, so that guy was a type of an antichrist, okay? We also see back in 170 B.C., uh, if you talk to Jewish people, there's a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian king, they refer to him as a type of an antichrist. And then some people say, well, it could have been Nero. Nero could have been the antichrist. Well, there's a problem with that, okay? And here's the problem. First of all, it says he's given 42 months to rule and reign, three and a half years, okay? It also says... All will worship him, okay? This is worldwide worship. It also says he will die, come back to life, 
as we've seen it, we'll see in verse 3. And then he gives that number 666 that you can't buy or sell. That's never happened before, okay? So this is futuristic. This Antichrist has not come yet. Now, he probably is alive today in the world today. Satan, I believe, has always had somebody in place so that when the rapture comes and he can set up his, seven, his kingdom on this world, the seven-year tribulation starts, he can put that guy in place. And I believe he has somebody right now handpicked. But I believe this guy he's got handpicked right now is probably the actual man because I believe we're that close probably. But it says here he is the Antichrist. Now, what does that mean? He has many different titles. I mentioned man of sin, um, but he is against Christ. He's in place of Christ, okay? We always think he's against Christ, Antichrist. But that word actually means in the place of Christ. He's going to come and he's going to look like the world's savior. You know, I love you people. I want to do everything I can to help you. We need to feed each other, and care for each other. But he's actually going to be a pretty evil person. So he means against, opposes, but it also means instead of or in place of. He is a counterfeit. People that don't know their Bible will never pick up on this. Now the Christians that are saved during the tribulation time period, I think they're going to have a good idea that this Antichrist is not going to be their friend. But there's an interesting fact. Down through the ages, I can find in the Bible where Satan possessed himself personally two different people. Judas, because Judas was referred to as the son of perdition. What's son of perdition mean? It means destruction. That was in John 17, verse 12. But then as we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, um, the Antichrist is also referred to as the son of perdition or the son of destruction. So them two people, I believe, were possessed by Satan. Judas and the Antichrist. I don't know of any others. If you, you know of any others, let me know. I know there's probably many, many that have been possessed by demons, okay? But let's look at Revelation 17, 2 here. I'll have it on the screen for you. And it says here in verse 12, Revelation 17, 12, I'm sorry. And the ten horns, this is talking about during the tribulation, which you saw are ten kings. So these are the kings under the Antichrist, or they will be, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour. One hour refers to a time period, specifically, no, we know that's three and a half years, with the beast, the Antichrist kingdom, okay? So now we go back to Daniel, amazingly, 2,700 years ago, Daniel wrote about this, okay? And it fits in with Revelation perfectly. Now, really, when you're going to study the book of Revelation, you probably should go through the book of Daniel first. Um, we're, we're, we haven't done that. Maybe we'll go through the book of Daniel here in the future. But anyways, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, then verse 24. Daniel had a vision. He said, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. Okay, so this beast of the first century, Rome, which encompasses Europe, this is going to also be the tribulation beast. Behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong, exceedingly, it had great iron teeth, it devoured broken pieces, stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse or different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Okay, as you notice, we just read Revelation 17, 12, it talks about that. So now, uh, verse 24, we see the revived Roman Empire, which encompasses the whole world. It says, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall arise after them, and shall be diverse or different from the first, and shall subdue three kings. So the Antichrist is going to have three kings that are going to be rebellious. He's going to straighten them out, subdue them in place. And so 10 minus 3 is 7, okay? So let's go ahead and look at uh, verse 2 next. Now we're going to refer to this stuff in the next couple weeks, so we'll go over it again and again so we'll get a better grasp and understand of it. But if you're in your Bibles, let's move on from verse 1 to verse 2 of Revelation chapter 13. And it says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the dragon is Satan. He gives him an authority, gives him the power, okay? Possesses him. When it says seat there, it's talking about throne. That's He's, he's going to be on a throne. He's going to be over this whole world, and he has great authority. God allows that. So, Notice it says like a leopard, and as I referred to in the past, that leopard referred to Greece, the nation of Greece. His feet were as a bear. That's uh, Media Persia back in history. And then his mouth as the mouth of a lion. That was Babylon, right? Okay, so we'll see this image on the next slide. I'll show you a picture to give you, because a picture is worth a thousand words. Maybe not quite a thousand, but it's worth a lot. Anyways, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Satan wants to mimic God. God, throughout the book of Revelation, 
He gave, he gave. He, he's the one that allows and stuff. And so Satan thinks, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to give him his power. He wants to mimic God and take the place of God here. So it says, he has a throne, great authority. To the world, he is the hero or a savior. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Always remember 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, because it says Satan is the god of this world. He's the one that fools everybody. Uh, you, read, you watch the news media. Most news medias will program your brain to be prepared for this and to understand this as the way the world wants you to or the way Satan wants you to. So be careful what news channels you're watching. But remember, these two beasts are subordinate to the dragon, Satan, but Satan is subordinate to who? God Almighty. So Satan can only do so much. He's got a leash on him, okay? You understand that? So let's look at verse 5. Now we're going to look at this verse in a couple weeks. But verse 5 in Revelation chapter 13, it tells us this. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. 40 and 2 months is what? It's 3 and a half years, 1260 days, right? So 40 and 2 months. He was given that time period. And it says there, power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months, 1260 days, 3 and a half years. Now we know who really is in control, don't we? We know God is in really control. But this beast empire will have the composite power of the three previous empires in past history. I call it Rome 2.0. Remember how, how vicious Rome was? You know, they put Christ on the cross. Christ went to the cross on his own, as we really know. But they crucified, they did some horrible things. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. We already looked at verse 7, but I want to go through this real quick. So Daniel 7 on the screen, we're going to look at verses 3 through 6. And this goes back from 700 B.C. all the way to kind of the first century. Now you know between Rome 1.0 there in that first century time period that we have this church 2,000 years, right? So then Rome 2.0 starts. But anyways, let's look at Daniel 7, verse 3 through 6. It says, And four great beasts came up out of the sea. Sea, by the way, as I mentioned, Gentile nations, diverse or different from one another. Verse 4 says 6, we'll see these three beasts or three empires. Verse 7, we'll talk about the last beast. And we mentioned that in verse slide 6 already. But the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. That's Babylon. Now, where's Babylon today? It's in the nation, a country of Iraq. And you know, Babylon's going to be restored again, I believe, literally. And then verse 5. And behold, another beast, the second like to a bear. This is Media Persia, okay, the Persian Empire. Uh, where's Persia today? It's Iran, right? Plus some other countries that I can't even pronounce their names. But, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. They said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Don't sound very uh, friendly, do they? Verse 6, After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, that was the nation of Greece, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fall. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. So here's, here's the thing. Talks about these beasts through the ages, right? Interestingly, when Daniel talks about this beast, he goes, Lion, bear, leopard, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece. When John refers to it there in Revelation 13, verse 2, he refers to it as... Um, Leopard, bear, lion, okay, we're referring back, going back to Greece, Media, Persia, Babylon. It's kind of cool how they do that. It's neat how the Bible is really organized, okay? God's Word. You can really truly understand it as you study it. But let's look at a brief list here. All these nations oppressed Israel, okay? God used them to discipline Israel. I'm going to give you a cool verse if you want to write this down. Write down Hosea chapter 13, verse 7 through 8. Okay, I don't have it on the screen. But Hosea chapter 13, verse 7 through 8, God uses nations to discipline uh, the nation of Israel many times, doesn't he? And it actually refers to these three creatures here in that verse. So that's Hosea chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. So first of all, the lion here we see represents Babylon. Now I'm not saying I got these dates exactly right, but the beginning 612 B.C., the bear, uh, which is Medio persia uh, came into being around 549 B.C., Leopard represents Greece, somewhere around 336 B.C. So let's look at this here. Then uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Remember Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel explained to him what that me dream meant, right? The head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian kingdom. The arms and chest of silver was the medio persia kingdom, right? And then went on to explain that the midsection and the upper thighs, the bronze 
was the lap, was the Greece kingdom, and then the lower legs is Rome. Now Rome divided into two sections. Okay, we know that. It's kind of cool how the Bible Daniel predicts what happened. We've seen it happen. But then that last kingdom is going to be the ten toes. Okay, so we'll talk about that later. But anyways, here we see how what's represented in Daniel chapter seven. It talks about these beasts: the lion, the bear, the leopard, and some kind of triaronosaurus, dinosaur, whatever is supposed to represent the fourth beast, right? Okay, so you see that the Bible, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, um, agree with what Revelation talks about. So we see these four beasts represent the Roman Empire, which came, started around 27 B.C., then eventually one side uh, dissipated, then the other side lasted a little longer. It's, it never really went out of complete existence, okay? But still, it's going to be revived. And when it revives... It's going to be a one-world government, one-world everything, politics, economy, religion. I put 20 dash dash. What year is it going to be in there? You guys fill that in. 2023, 2024? It's, it's getting closer. I don't know. But this revived Roman Empire that they're working on right now to control the whole world is going to come on the scene in the near future. Okay? So, Daniel chapter 2, verses 40 and 41. It says here, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron... Well, I could get the verse up there. Okay, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these shall break in pieces and bruise. And then, verse 41, and whereas thou saw the feet and the toes, okay, the ten, ten toes, ten toes, right? That's going to be the ten, ten sections of the world in the end times. Part of potter's clay and part of iron. Now, we're not going to get into this right now, but it's kind of barely held together because it's potter's clay and iron. Uh, we could also go look at verse 43 of Daniel 2 and go back to Genesis chapter 6 and talk about this, but that's not the scope for right now. But the Antichrist is going to control this, but it's going to be somewhat tenuous, okay? Weak. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou saw the iron mixed with miry clay, okay? Talks about this end time empire. So let's go ahead and look at our last verse here in Revelation chapter 13, which is verse 3. And uh, let me read this. Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it had were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. You see that? One of the heads were wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and the world were amazed and wondered after the beast. One of his heads was wounded. This, is, this happens during the midpoint of the tribulation, and we're going to see this a little more in the fourth bullet point here, but the second bullet point, his deadly wound was healed. In other words, I think this is a fatal wound. He died, and he was brought back to life. And as you know, all the world wondered, were amazed, marveled after the beast. They thought, wow. And that's the world. They're going to fall for this, okay? And here's the thing. The word there for wounded is the word spazo, and in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, where it talks about that lamb, Jesus, in heaven, it says he was slain, spazo. He, and you know, Jesus was killed, died, and came back to life again. It's the same word. It's the same word, spazo, here for the Antichrist, and the same word for Christ, spazo, okay? So Reve Revelation 13, 3, compare that with Revelation 5, 6. It's the same word. So I believe this guy actually does suffer a true death. Now, whether he does or doesn't, it could be a counterfeit. But anyways, the fifth bullet point here says this is all part of the dragon's attempt to counterfeit the death and resurrection of Christ. I believe it will be an actual death. I know there's going to be a grand delusion. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 through 12 talks about power, signs, lie, and wonders. People will believe a lie. They will. And in verse 15, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, it says Satan gives life to an image, which I believe is uh, artificial intelligence of some being. But here's what I think about this narrative through the book of Revelation chapter 13 that's interesting. This word and, which is the Greek word chi, conjunction used to connect thoughts, it's used in the Bible like 10,000 times. If anybody ask you what word, word is used in the Bible more than any other word, you say it's the word and, okay? Word chi. But if you look at Revelation chapter 1 through Revela uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, through the last verse there, you'll see that this word is used like 16 of the 18 verses to start off the verse, okay? So Revelation 13, verse 1, through the very end here, in Revelation 13, verse 18, it says, and, 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 and. So the, the narrative keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, and keeps building upon it. Now, that's, that's just something I thought was interesting. So you see that a lot. 
Okay, here's the thing. Back around 30 AD, somewhere around that time period, Jesus said this was actually going to happen. This is what Jesus said. I come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Jesus said they rejected him, nailed him to cross, but they're going to accept this Antichrist guy when he comes. Doesn't that break your heart when you think about it? It really should. The Antichrist is a copycat. 2 Corinthians 11.4 says he is an angel of light. He deceives, he fools. So there's a concern, there's a definite concern, and that is that Antichrist is a liar. Satan is the father of lies. Do you want truth? Can you handle the truth? We want truth, don't we? We want the truth. So let's look at this. This is what Peter said. Peter said in Acts 4, verse 10 through 12, and he was talking to the Jewish people, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, specific person, specific city he lived in, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, by God, does this man, Jesus, stand here before you whole. He is risen. Then he goes and says, This is the stone, this is Jesus, which was set at nothing of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 6, Peter talks about this again, about Jesus being the head of the cornerstone. That's 1 Peter 2, 6. Then he goes on to say, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven, anywhere, 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 given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name under heaven given among men where we must be saved. Please, please don't go trusting in some other false god or false teaching. Jesus Christ proved who he was. Study him. Satan presents 99% truth and, and then 1% false, and that'll be enough to keep people from going to heaven because he'll put a little bit of mixture into the gospel of salvation. He'll water it down. He'll make it muddy. Um, we know that Satan will say, you have to turn from your sins. You have to confess your sins. Uh, ask Jesus into your heart. Give your life to Jesus. Commit your life. Prove that you're saved. Persevere to the end. Added works in many different ways to the gospel salvation. Whereas, it says in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which I have done, but according to his mercy he saved me. Do you understand that? You can't do anything righteous to save yourself. Don't get all this stuff mixed in here. It'll confuse you. You'll say, my, well, my pastor says that. This pastor says that. I don't care. What does the Bible say? We've got to stick by the Bible. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Is that pretty clear? And then, don't fight this. It is 100% Christ. Now, Apostle John, who was, wrote the book of Revelation, five years before he wrote the book of Revelation, he wrote the book of 1 John. Okay, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And here's what he said five years earlier in 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. If somebody asks you... Um, if you were to die today, are you going to heaven? How would you answer? Well, yes, I'm going to heaven because I placed my faith in Jesus Christ and he promised me everlasting life. Very few people can say that. Most people will say, well, I hope so, I think so, I'm sure I am. I don't know. You know, but you can know for sure. 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you, John said this, that he that believeth on me has everlasting life. If you have everlasting life, what do you have? You have everlasting life. So I hope everybody understands that today. If you don't, trust him. Today, if you're watching this, trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior before it's too late. You don't want to be left behind. Yes, you can get saved, but you can also get deceived. So I would trust him before the rapture comes. Simple faith in Christ. He promises you everlasting life. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close in prayer. I'm going to have our singers come up because they're going to lead us in this last song, which is Lord, I Need You. Now, this is a little bit longer song. It's like four minutes, so, but we could survive, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for today that we can learn about what's going on here in the book of Revelation chapter 13. It's extremely exciting and interesting. We can put this all together and we can make sense of it. I know we covered a lot today, but we'll go back over this and review this more and more and get a better grasp or a better understanding of this as we go through it, as we progress through uh, the book of Revelation until we get to chapter 20 and we see the millennial kingdom. Chapter 21 and 22, we see the new heaven and the new earth. Boy, we got a future that you could not imagine. And so if you haven't trusted him, I pray you'll trust him because it's the most glorious thing. We'll spend eternity with Jesus, Jesus Christ. So I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.